Hey, it's been so great uh, to worship the Lord. I am so, gosh, so encouraged when we come together and sing. I'm like, yes, we believe this. And oftentimes we, we need faith for each other. We've talked about that. When we sing together, uh, it's the beauty and image. It's a proverb of the church, really. Everyone singing in harmony, singing the same words together with one voice, all of us individually. Beautiful thing. I hope you've already been encouraged today. Some of you are, are watching us online, and uh, we're glad that you're with us today. But sorry, nothing like being here together. We're talking about friendship today, as Megan noted. And uh, I want to start with this. Groucho Marx, some of y'all know that name. He was a, probably one of the most famous American comedians back in the 1900s, like back in the mid-1900s. Um, and uh, he said this, when you're in jail, uh, a good friend is trying to bail you out. He said, a best friend uh, is in the cell next to you saying, man, that was fun. <laughs> now, I think uh, I, we, uh, I have some friends like that, but um, I think the best friends are probably those going to keep you out of jail, don't you think? So whether in jail, out of jail, we all need friends. And today we're going to talk about that. You would think in America with nearly 340 million people that we wouldn't lack for people in our lives. And yet, research studies show us that Americans, in many ways, are lonelier than we've ever been before. Survey on American life revealed what most of us already know. Over the past, gosh, few decades with this study, Americans have half the number of friends they used to have. And we all know what the pandemic the past few years have done to friends. As it's isolated us, many of us have lost friendships we had, perhaps formerly, and some of us literally have lost friends to death. And that is where many of us are in this stage of life. We've talked about also what the survey revealed. With that comes this isolation. We have this rise of anxiety and depression. And I would argue it's because of a lack of close friendships. Families, or disconnected. If you're with us last week, we talked about family, the importance of familial relationships, how paramount that is. And, and I want to say this, we talk so much about families. I say that often we do, and we have a lot of young couples and families and kids here in our church. And if you're a young adult or if you're single, which can take place in any stage of life, any, you know, somewhere along that, that spectrum of life, oftentimes you can feel in the church, perhaps, uh, teenagers or young adults can feel uh, the goal in the Christian life is to get married. That's not the goal of the Christian life. The Bible teaches us, I think there's, there's reasons for this, we have the highest vision of marriage that you're going to find anywhere, in any religion, any worldview, a high vision of Christian marriage. But we also have the highest view of the individual, which is that if you've received Christ, Created in the image of God. You are loved by him. You are gifted. You are whole, integrated. You are complete. Apart from marriage. Apart from another person. And yet, the Proverbs speak, I'm saying all this to say, the Proverbs speaks more about deep, abiding, loving, intimate companionship. More than it does about marriage. And evidently, finding good friends has been a challenge for a long, long time. So we're going to the ancient wisdom of Proverbs to teach us. Because God's word never fails and it's always the same in every year. Are you ready to hear from God? I want you to turn to Proverbs 27. And today, I want you to leave encouraged, grateful, and hopeful. Because in Proverbs 27, you can turn there and I want you to stay there. This chapter is a kind of manual. Um, here we see a collection, you may know this, a collection of Solomon's Proverbs collected during the time of Hezekiah's reign. And in this chapter, we have the Hebrew alphabet. We see this in other places in the Psalms where it's broken down like an acrostic. And this was for, by the way, for memorization. They weren't on their screens all the time. They weren't always watching other things and having, they were in the word learning large portions, memorizing large portions of scripture, which we should do the same. And here we see what you could call the A to Z's or maybe better, the ABC's of friendship. And I want you to be challenged 
We're going to learn that uh, the qualities of friendship we're looking at are honesty and empathy and constancy. Let's, let's talk about qualities of life-giving friendships, okay? If you take notes on sermons, you can find your bulletin there, and there's also the response guide that you go to that our own Megan Hendrickson, myself, our preaching team, teaching team works together to provide for you so that you can go deeper in this message because preaching without practice means nothing. I can dive into this text. I will take you on a journey on what I have learned throughout hours upon hours of preparation. But if you don't apply this, the Proverbs, which is applied knowledge, Solomon say, I'm sorry, but he would, these are his words, you're a fool. You're a fool to hear truth and not apply it. So you're listening from that posture, okay? So let's dive in because if you apply these truths to your life, this is my desire for you. You're gonna be happier, healthier, and you just might stay out of jail. All right, so first, number one, honesty. Let's talk about it. Do not boast about tomorrow for you do not know what a day may bring. I'm going to say, what's that have to do with friendship? This sounds a lot like James 4, 14. You remember that where it says, don't, don't plan for tomorrow. Act like you're going to do this. I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to save here and I'm going to make money here. Go to this city. You say, no, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know what's happening this afternoon. And this is wisdom to live by, but watch this. Here's why he's saying this. Look at verse two. Let another praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger, not your own lips. What he's saying is don't boast about yourself and what you're going to do, because see, our plans are are often determined, are always determined by our own self-assessment of who we are and what we can do, what we like, what we don't like. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this. And he says that a great quality of of friendship is how this is applied is not self-praise but praise from others. Look at what he says there, a stranger. What is that about? A stranger uh, is completely objective. A stranger who who maybe is not so close to you can say, you know what, here's what I assess about you. And he's saying uh, a stranger is objective, okay? A friend outside of us is what he's saying, is objective. You don't praise yourself from your own mouth. What we need, even that in comparison, It's nothing compared to praise from another. And he's saying, you know this, praise of oneself is not only arrogance and pride, it's also insecurity. Not good qualities of a friendship. And once again, God's word is more relevant than today's newsfeed. Because we have some shameless self-promotion going on in our day. Not just because it's the political season. There's that. You know, whether it's a celebrity, got it. But everybody has a platform, right? And and on social media, I'm going to show you how great my life is and how wonderful it is until I pull away from it and I am dying inside. Technology hasn't drawn us together. In some ways it has. In other ways, it has disconnected us. Solomon is saying, praising yourself is worthless compared to the praise of others. And his reasoning is interesting here. It's this this idea that you're making uh, all kinds of plans and claiming what your life is going to be about. That's pride and that's boasting. So the wisdom here is this. If you want to be a good friend, find good friends. Here it is. Look at the direction in which the praise flows. If you have a friend that's constantly talking about themselves, right? They're always talking about what they're doing and they want to talk about themselves. You've probably assessed that and it's likely why they're not a good friend, right? Someone is always talking about their, their job or they want to bring up their, their children. I get it. You know, all all the stuff. Notice I didn't say grandchildren because all of our grandchildren are perfect. Um, and so, you know, we, we don't go there, but true friends, true friends, praise, encourage you, right? They encourage you. False friends put you down. Look for a friend who can bring honest praise. That's the other thing that we'll see. And an an honest praise means that I can reach out to you and I can say, I I need encouragement today. That's an honest friend, right? I need need praise. I got a a text from a good friend of mine that I have known from seminary, um, soulmate. I mean, like deep, deep friend who's in ministry. So we have this real connection. We have since the moment we met. 
And uh, a couple weeks ago, I got a text from him saying, hey, I need to talk. We talk every, every month for an hour and a half. We have a, have a set time that we talk. And we've been doing this for three decades, longer than a lot of you have been alive. And um, we, so when I read Jonathan and David, I'm, I'm like, I, I get that. I have other friends who are like that. I have a best friend who I've known since the time I was two years old. Who, um, who may just be watching my phone. I've told you about this group of friends I have. My phone has been blowing up. Here is a text since I've been up here. Like, hey, what time are you preaching? What's going on, bro? I want to watch, you know. And uh, guys, I'm right here. Okay, if you're watching, um, here we are. And I say that because these are friends who have been there with me all through, I mean, years and years. And they mean the world to me. They mean the world to me. I've had people who've said, Jeff, how in the world do you, you know, do you do what you do? And how have you made it <laughs> through COVID? And how, what is it? I would say first, I have a wife who is my therapist. Okay. I have a wife who loves me with everything she's got. And I praise God for that. However, I have deep abiding friendships that in many ways, in other ways, go deeper than what Stacy and I might talk about in terms of my, my vocation, my life, other men in my life. And I say all this because just a couple weeks ago, yeah, Jonathan, literally, Jonathan is his name, reached out and said, I need to talk. And, and I knew that he needed encouragement. And then he's encouraging me and we get off the phone and after talking, we feel a bit lighter, right? Solomon is saying a key trait in, in your friendships is honesty. And that happens over time. But watch this. It's not just saying nice things about each other. It's not simply encouraging each other. Look at verse 5. Jump to verse 5. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. You following that? Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse, or many, are the kisses of an enemy. Open correction, not hidden love. See, hidden love is cowardly. And it's only love by name. It, it hurts people, actually. If someone is hurting or if they're hurting themselves, for you to do nothing, that is not love. And open rebuke here doesn't mean public rebuke, by the way. It means direct, explicit. And this can only happen really in the context of a loving friendship. Wounds by a friend versus wounds by an enemy are as dissimilar as a scalpel in the hands of a surgeon and a scalpel in the hands of a murderer. Two very different things. In fact, in Proverbs 29, 5, it says, a man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. How about that? It's a trap. Because truth without grace can be used as a weapon, but grace without truth can be used as a weapon. It's just sentimentality, and it, and it just leaves us in our flaws and in our failure and offers no hope for rescue. Do you have friends like that in your life? Even as you're listening, I know you're doing this. The Spirit of God is speaking to you. The first quality of a great friendship is honesty. Do you have friends who are honest in your life? And I know this can be a subjective experience or, or question. Some of you say, yeah, I do. I'm not talking about, y'all talking about the Cowboys. I'm not talking about you, you're honest about, about your, your take on football, your favorite golfer. Yeah. I'm talking about the most, I, I've spoken to a group of men recently, the most courageous men among us, true about women as well, are those who are honest and who receive honesty about your failure, about your sin, about when you've messed up. Honesty is the first quality of a great friendship. But watch this, it's matched with empathy. Empathy is the second thing I want you to look at here. Empathy is the ability to, to sense when, what another is feeling. And then here it is, imagine what it's like to be them. Not everyone has this trait. Some of us have it through the roof and we're feeling all the feels. All the time. And we wonder, well, you don't see this? Did you not catch in that meeting what was going on with that person? We need to reach out to them. Look at what it says here. Verse 3. A stone is heavy and sand is weighty. Especially wet sand, someone's noted. But a fool's provocation, that's inciting or goading, is heavier than both. 
Wrath is cruel, anger is overwhelming, but who can stand before jealousy? Now, you say, what does this have to do with friendship? These are exactly the opposite of empathy, is what I'm getting to here. Volatile people who, whose emotions can't stay in check are not going to be good friends. And people like that actually need help. What we have here are the four horsemen of, vol of volatility. Provocation, okay, provoking or annoying, okay? Wrath, anger, and jealousy. Now, you say, well, who would have friends like that? Okay, anger you can manage. If you have a friend who keeps coming back, I'm sorry I did it again. I'm sorry I hurt you when I said that. Okay, there needs to be perhaps some boundaries. They need to get some help. But what Solomon is saying here is jealousy is much more insidious. Because jealousy, you know, anger, you, you can have some coping skills, but jealousy is kind of this insatiable, unrelenting kind of thing that drives their emotional instability. So anger and jealousy is heavy and weighty. Empathy uh, lightens the burden. I hope you have friends who, who carry the load with you. And you know if you do. When you're with them, you feel lighter when you're done. You want to reach out to them because you're carrying a weight and you know you can reach out to them. Empathy lightens the load. I love Proverbs 25, 20. It says this, whoever sings a song to a heavy heart is like one who takes off a garment on a cold day. Isn't that beautiful? We've told you throughout this series, we're teaching you how to read the Psalms. And like we're doing here, modeling this for you, because often we'll read a psalm. Oh, there's that, there's that. Don't understand that one. Oh, there's that one. What does that have to do with that one? What about that one? And we read it like that. That's not, that's not how to approach this, the, I mean, the Proverbs. The, that's not how you approach the Proverbs. You, you dive deeper, and, and I'm showing you, teaching you how to do this. A godly, life-giving friend is like a warm blanket on a cold day. Someone who blesses you, they sing over you, if you will. Empathy and awareness allows you to speak truth in love, but it, but, it, but it requires timing and tact as well. Some Proverbs are a bit humorous. Proverbs 27, uh, this same chapter, verse 14. Whoever blesses his neighbor with a loud voice rising early in the morning will be counted as cursing. You track in with that one? Some of y'all would say, if you come at me before I've had my coffee, you're just cussing at me. Stop Stay away until I'm ready. I mean, I love that. And then we, we know too, so it's, you know, you come talking up a storm, but, but it's, it's this empathy has this sense of timing intact and yes, honesty. Proverbs 27, seven, back to Proverbs 27, now that the text, seven. One who is full loads honey, but to one who is hungry, everything is bitter. Everything bitter is sweet, it says. Now, what is this? If you're full, if you're full, okay, you, you don't even want honey. As rare as it was and as sweet as it is. And, and, and if you are hungry, then any, something bitter is good. Like, I, I need anything. Here's what it's saying here. Stuffed or starved. Neither are managing their appetite well. Neither are managing the intake well. You can say both are eating disorders. Those who are not satisfied, and this is where this runs, if we're not satisfied in God and who we are in him, are going to be trying to suck dry from the other what the other was never intended to give them. This is it true in marriage? Yes. But it's true in friendship. We, we need to find, the key principle here is this, we find our worth in God, who he says we are. And if we've received his grace... Christ dying on the cross for our sin, taking our sin away, we receive by faith this grace that's come to us. Not our works, nothing we do. We receive that. Now we have this new identity, a new position. We've been made right before God, justified. I don't have to validate myself, justify myself anymore in any relationship because it starts with a justification that come to me through, through God in Christ. That is the central focus of a healthy person and a healthy relationship. And we need to get underneath and let the gospel drive everything that we do. Because if you found your identity there, you can be honest. You can have empathy because Jesus has it for us. 
And when you feel the same about someone else and nothing like a bond of, of Christ, nothing like Christian friendships, but when you find someone with the same interests, beliefs and hobbies, uh, C.S. Lewis said the first um, question or, or entry into friendship is essentially you too. And in the four loves, great classic book on, on loves of all kinds, he talks about friendship and listen to this. He, he writes, friendship arises out of mere companionship when two or more of the companions discover that they have in common some insight or interest or even taste, which the others do not, the others in a group, you know, he was a part of the inklings, had good friends, but he says, when, when the others in the group don't share and which till that moment, each believed to be his own unique treasure or burden. The typical expression of opening friendship would be something like, what? You too? I thought I was the only one. It is when two persons, two such persons, discover one another, when whether with immense difficulties and semi-articulate fumblings or with what would seem to be to us amazing and elliptical instant uh, speed, they share, they share a vision. And it is then that friendship is born. And instantly they stand together in immense solitude, as if to say, yes, we have found friendship. Friendship is honest. Friendship has empathy. And finally, friendship has constancy. Okay, the third point here, the last verses here show us what it's like to have friends for the long haul. And then I'm gonna make some application before we're done. Friends who stay in, look at verse eight. Like a bird that strays from its nest is a man who strays from his home. The friend doesn't stray away. Now, we need to understand context. As we noted last week, families live close together. Brothers and sisters live close together. The, the implication here is that, that leaving your home would be not willing, but unwilling often, whether it's war or famine or disease or something else. But you're, you're to stay and protect the nest as a family. And he's saying, we're saying here, good friends mean that you're going to help you stay together, right? Stay tight, stay close, remain in the Christian context, remain in him. You're going to stay there. Remember who you are in him. A good friend will help you do this and, and challenge the attacks that will come at you from the outside and from the inside. And this is what he's getting to. Stay in the nest means you're going to be faithful and true. Now, here's what happens in our day. This is my experience. Um, this is not as much about proximity, though it is, this, it is that in this context. The, the better, and we'll see here in a moment, it's better to have friends close by than, than a brother who lives far away. And, and this is so true in, in my life, I know. I have friends, uh, as I noted, I have friends who are in a, I mean, like a tight group, a few guys. One of them was our, my young life leader when I was in high school. And the other, Dan, I, I've known since I was two years old. And others in, in, that, that are friends, and we keep up with each other, constantly encouraging, every morning encouraging each other. Throughout the day, hey, I want to remind you guys of this. It's been happening this morning. And I say that because it doesn't necessarily mean in our day close proximity. It could mean proximity of, uh, of, of love and understanding and relationship. Like Dan and I, literally a path from our house to the other house growing up all my childhood days from the time I was two years old. Some of you have friends like that. I was talking to a couple of our members earlier today who, who were pointing out right there, we've been friends for 60 plus years. We met here in this church, is what they said. There's nothing like that. And if you don't have friends like that, I'll, I've got a challenge for you as we close. Look at verse nine. Oil and perfume, okay, make the heart glad and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. It's saying that good counsel and companionship of a loving friend is sweet, okay? But oil, again, context helps us. Oil was used for a lot of things. Oil was food, it was medicine. It was uh, fuel. It was used in rituals of worship. Uh, so I guess what we're saying, what Solomon is saying, the only essential oil that you need um, is friendship. Because of all the things that oil does, friendships help you. Look at verse 10. Do not forsake your friend and your father's friend. And do not go to your brother's house in the day of calamity. Okay, watch this. 
back to verse 8, assuming the brother is far away. Okay? So hang on to friends, even family friends, tried and true friends. Hang on to them. Maybe a, bro- maybe a dad's friend or a parent's friend because they know you from the time you were born. Better is a neighbor who is near than a brother who's far away. You see? Now, I love my brothers. I have two brothers. I'm the middle son. I love my brothers. I'm not near my brothers. I haven't lived near my brothers for years since college on. And so I understand what Proverbs 18, 24 says. It says, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Sometimes that's literal for a lot of us here. There's two things there. One is the idea, like I've shared, um, these old friends that I have. Um, I love this song. Ben Rector has a great song, and and the essence of the chorus is, um, there's nothing like old friends because you can't make old friends. And... And the other thing he's saying here is, you know, you can have a lot of friends. I, I, I've got, like, I'm, I'm an extrovert. Most of y'all know that. And I count so many of you friends. But more realistically, you're going to have very few that you can go deep and in the long haul, what I call garden friends. These friends of mine are my 3 a.m. friends. Jesus had three of them. And you need the same. Proverbs 27, 17, maybe the most famous verse on friendship. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. So we need others to speak into our lives. If you've ever heard yourself speaking on a recording, you go, that's not me. And it's because you've never really heard yourself. You've only heard yourself like me right now, in my head, in through my ears. I don't really know what I sound like. But you do. Friends who come alongside us, who are honest, empathetic, constantly with us, they can say, I don't think you know what your words sound like, and I don't think you know what your actions are telling me or the rest of us. We need friends like that because a friend, look at, look at Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born out of adversity. So um, not only do I keep up with some friends and lots of friends here in town, but I... I keep up with my mom on a regular basis. Uh, This past week, I'm talking to her. And now more and more, as I talk to my mom, she's sharing with me yet another friend has passed away. And that can be overwhelming. That can be grief upon grief. And sometimes we don't know what we have until it's gone. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of my heroes of the faith, many of you know he was in prison ultimately executed under Hitler's Third Reich for being attached to um, an assassination plot against Hitler. He wrote a classic book called Life Together. And I'll close with, with these thoughts and then application. A classic exploration of Christian community. He wrote this. Listen to this. It is true, of course, that what is an unspeakable gift of God for the lonely individual is easily disregarded and trodden underfoot. By those who have it, the gift, every day. Remember, he's in prison. He's writing this. It is easily forgotten that the fellowship of the Christian brethren is a gift of grace. A gift of the kingdom of God. That any day may be taken from us. That the time that still separates us from utter loneliness may be brief indeed. Therefore... Let him who until now has had the privilege of living in common Christian life with other Christians praise God's grace from the bottom of his heart and let him thank God on his knees and declare it is grace. It's nothing but grace that we are allowed to live in community with other Christian brothers and sisters. Friends, how will you apply this message? If you're like me, and I'm a bit ahead of you in in all that this message has stirred up in my heart, I've already reached out to several friends to say, I praise God for you. I don't want to take you for granted. I met with a pastor friend this week over lunch, and I'm so grateful for you in my life. And he's saying the same thing. Here's here's the application. Number one, reach out to a friend today. 
before the sun goes down. Say, I'm grateful you're in my life. Be explicit. Be honest. Be upfront. Someday that friendship on this side won't be there anymore. And they need to know today what they mean to you. Praise another friend. And if you don't have friends like this and you find yourself among the lonely, I would encourage you with this. You say, Jeff, I don't have friends of decades of friends. If you're young, you start now. But I'm telling you this, with those you need to go deeper with, you probably already know them. And you need to be intentional. That would be your challenge. Reach out to them. Say, I'm going to go deeper. Or just do it. Let's do lunch this week. And then we're going to do lunch next week. And keep on meeting with them and talking about what really matters. Don't waste your life. Have friends around you that will go the long haul with you. This is the challenge today. And none of us are perfect friends. We know that. Don't leave thinking I'm a perfect friend because I'm not. I have failed my friends along the way. But I praise God that I can have a friendship with the perfect friend. That there's grace for all of my failures. The one who is the friend of sinners. Who came to each one of us. The one who laid down his life for his friends. So that you and I, as it says in James 2, 23, can become like Abraham, a friend of God, made righteous because of our faith in him, what he has done for us, nothing that we have done. Jesus is the perfect friend. And he wants to be your friend today. That's where it all starts. And if you've never received Christ, in him you can be fully known and fully loved. That's why he's the best friend of all friends out of which every friendship comes that is marked by empathy. It's marked by, yes, honesty and consistency. And it all starts when we embrace the love of Christ for us. So let's all pray together as we close our time. And God has been speaking to your heart. And as we close, I'm going to ask you, what are you going to do? Whose face has God put in your mind, reach out to them and say, I praise God for you. Let's be intentional about our friendships. For you, maybe you need to receive Christ, his grace right now. As Aiden has modeled for us today, you need to come to him, be bold, come to him. Maybe you need to be baptized. You need to join the fellowship of the church where Christian community is this gift of grace that you need to be intentional about. Lord, I pray that you will stir in all of our hearts and we will never be the same after this message. We need each other. And some of us have been alone, isolated for far too long and all we need to do is come to you, our best friend, and then go to others and love them as you have loved us. Thank you, Jesus, for being a friend of sinners like us. Thank you for dying on the cross so that we could live and love in this lifetime and experience the great gift of friendship. And as we go, we're going, to be, uh, we're going to be living this out. Be honest, empathetic. We're going to be constant friends with others in our lives. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. Amen. amen.